good to have you with us here in church. We're going to have a carol. It's one of my least favourite carols. But we'll get it out of the road quickly. See him lying on a bed of straw, a drafty stable with an open door. It's a particular favourite of many people in the church. That's not mine. But, uh, we'll sing this. If you're able to stand, then please do so. And uh, sing out as best you can. This, uh, this carol, see him lying on a bed of straw. Thank you for, for singing that carol so well this morning. Let's have a prayer and ask for God's help. Dear God, we thank you for that baby who came to the manger, that baby who was born in Bethlehem, that baby who grew up to be the saviour of the world. Dear God, we thank you for, for today. We thank you for everyone who's been able to make it out. We think of the the road conditions, the, the storm conditions, we think of people on the, the east coast of the country, particularly with snow, and we just ask for your safety and, and help with everybody. Be with us as we meet here in church, that we'll be able to gain something from yourself as we listen to the message, as we would sing the songs, and as we would listen to the video. We do indeed ask that you would be with us, and we ask us all in your name. Amen. Yeah, we're going to have uh, this week's video. So, can anybody remember what last week's video was about? Or a seven days past? Lynn? Advent. Advent, well done. So, last week was the introduction to what Advent meant. So, we're going to have week one of Advent. And if you can remember any of the images that came up in last week's video, it did tell you what the first week, um, what the message of Advent week one was going to be. Anybody remember what week one Advent is? 
It went too fast. Well, it did go really fast. I'll give you that. It was a particularly fast-moving video. The word that came up was hope. Uh, the, the candle uh, for week one uh, it signifies hope. And what we're going to do, uh, if we can get them to work, is every week we're going to light a candle. But we'll do it safely. We'll do it with the ones with batteries and not the ones with proper candles because uh, I don't really want to drip wax all over the piano. Hope. What does hope mean? What is your hopes? What's your hopes for the future? What's your hopes for today? Uh, who gives you hope? What you can put your hope in? The, the video that we're going to show, um, and we can make the sound it's on, um, is a prayer for hope. And uh, that's going to come up when I, when I press this button now. And hopefully you'll be able to look at some of the images, some of the words, and just listen to this prayer that's going to take place. Sorry, one more page before we did that. Liam's advent calendar with the chocolate. Liz's advent calendar with the, the sewing on it. Uh, dairy milk still wins with me. Uh, even though I haven't been given an advent calendar this year. We bought advent calendars for other people, but I didn't get one. So <laughs> if my children are uh, not in the house, I might steal their advent chocolate. <laughs> so uh, dairy milk or... Uh, tapestry, what's your, your uh, thing of Advent? But here's a prayer for Advent Week 1, Hope. very last image says we will bring the hope of Jesus to the world that would be my prayer for Bethany that we would bring the hope of Jesus to the world one candle illuminates a darkened room if one of us goes and tells one other person the mathematicians in the room will tell you what a compound uh, example of that is one becomes two becomes four becomes eight becomes sixteen becomes 32, 64, 128. After that, I run out of numbers and fingers. But if we were to tell one person about the hope of Jesus, what a wonderful Christmas that would be. And uh, for those who don't have any hope, where the, the world is dark, that the light of Jesus illuminates that, and that's our message for, for the world, for Bethany, that we would uh, share the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to have the next song.
called my guardian, king of love and grace. All my hopes and fears are in your hands. There's a very old song. He's got the whole world in his hands. You can put all your, your fears in the hands of the Lord Jesus and trust him to be your guardian, to be your guide and to show you the way. Children's chorus, <clears throat> but again, talking about having faith and hope and trust, step by step, on and on. We will walk with Jesus till the journey's done. <laughs> Thank you. 
decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. Let's see you sing. I have decided to follow Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back, you were behind me, the cross before me. message has been prepared by Derek Watt from Greenock. Uh, Derek's been associated with speaking in this church for many, many years. And uh, we look forward to what Derek has to share with us today. And we do hope that you'll enjoy uh, what he has prepared uh, to speak here at Bethany. So let's listen to what Derek has to share with us this afternoon. Well, a very good morning to you. Um, my reading this morning, or one of my readings this morning, was from Psalm 73. And, and I want to read that psalm to you this morning. It was written by a man called Asaph. Now, I know very little about Asaph. I had to go to my Bible dictionary to discover just exactly who Asaph was. And I've got my Bible dictionary right here beside me to help me to give you the, some of the information, at least, that we have about Asaph. And what I do know is he was a descendant of Gershom, and he was of the tribe, the son of Levi, of the tribe of Levi. So what I do know about Asaph is that he was a, a priest. But I also know that he was a musician, he was a singer, and I also know that he was a poet. And the other piece of information that I have here in front of me is that he was a seer. In other words, he was a prophet. So what I do know about Asaph is he was a very godly man, very religious man, a God-fearing man. 
And it was this man, Asaf, that wrote Psalm number 2073. And so I'm going to take time this morning to read it to you. And if you've got a Bible, you might want to just follow me as I read it. I'm reading from the New Living Translation this morning. A translation that I, I really do quite enjoy reading in my uh, daily readings. So here's Psalm 73, written by Asaph. Truly God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. But as for me, I almost lost my footing. My foot was slipping and I was almost gone. For I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. They seem to live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. They don't have troubles like other people. They are not plagued with problems like everyone else. They wear pride like a jeweled necklace and clothe themselves with cruelty. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish, could ever wish for. They scoff and speak only evil. In their pride they seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens, and their words strut out throughout the earth. And so the people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all their words. What does God know? They ask. Does the Most High even know what's happening? Look at these wicked people, enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. If I had already spoken this way to others, I would have been a traitor to your people. So I tried to understand why the wicked prosper. But what a difficult task it is. Then I went into your sanctuary, O God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. Truly you put them on a slippery path and send them sliding over the cliff to destruction. In an instant they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. When you arise, O Lord, you will laugh at their silly ideas, as a person laughs at dreams in the morning. Then I realized that my heart was bitter, and I was all torn up inside. I was so foolish and ignorant, I must have seemed like a senseless animal to you. Yet I still belong to you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, leading me to a glorious destiny. Whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. My health may fail and my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. Those who desert him will perish, for you destroy those who abandon you. But as for me, how good it is to be near God. I have made the Sovereign Lord my shelter, and I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do. Now I think if I was to stop there, and maybe you were to go and get your Bible and read Psalm 73 on your own, you really would be blessed just reading it, we should discover, as I discovered this morning, as I was sitting reading, is that my heart is a very, very confused place. I really do I admit to that to you this morning. My heart sometimes can be full of praise and worship, and sometimes this heart of mine can be full of doubt and insecurity. So our hearts are, conf are confused. We can't always trust our heart. <clears throat> and one of the difficulties is, is trying to discover exactly what our hearts are. What does the Bible mean when it speaks about our heart? I mean, clearly, and I think even a casual reader will understand that it doesn't mean uh, that vessel, that muscle in our bodies that pump um, blood around our bodies. We, we know it doesn't mean that. But certainly in the Western world, what the heart appears to mean is a place, it's a, a storehouse, if you like, of affection, 
It's a storehouse of love and purity. It seems to be, according to our thinking, it's a storehouse of goodness, of peace, of affection, of sympathy. Our hearts, according to what we are encouraged to believe, are good places. And yet, when we read in Psalm 73 about Asif, that was not the case with his heart. It was in his heart that he had confusion and doubts about God. It was in his heart that he questioned whether he should remain a, a God-fearing man or whether he should join the wicked because it seemed to him the wicked were getting a better life than he was. They were prospering. They seemed to be happy. They seemed to be healthy. And he really was confused and wondering if he'd really got things right. His heart, when he wrote this psalm or this song, was in tur turmoil. So really, what is our heart? What does the Bible mean when it speaks about our heart? Well, I'm hoping that we're going to discover just a little bit about that this morning. Now, you will hear, you possibly have said that you love somebody with all of your heart. I'm sure you've said that. And I'm sure you've meant that. It's the same heart that the Asaph is talking about in Psalm 33, by the way. You possibly like me, and you've said that you absolutely love ice cream and strawberries. Same word. Coming from the same heart. So you can see just how confused we can be about this hearts of ours. Just what is it? What is this storehouse that the Bible refers to as heart? Well, there are other readings that we can have that will enlighten our, our thinking about about our heart. And I'm just searching about for some quotations this morning that I can maybe help you to, to read. For example, in Jeremiah, here's something that the Bible says about the heart. It says the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. My word. That's what the Bible says about our heart. The words that it uses are dreadful words. It's deceitful and desperately wicked. Now, I'm sure you're like me, and you don't like that. I'm sure you're like me, and you might even think, well, I'm not like that. Other people might be like that. But this is the description that the Bible gives of our hearts. It's above all things deceitful and wicked. Now, what on earth does that mean? Well, what does deceitful mean? Well, it really means not being 100% honest. That's really what it means. We can say to our loved ones that we love them with all of our hearts. And then we have to ask ourselves, well, is that really absolutely true? Do sometimes I not find them nuisances and pests? And sometimes might even think, I wish they would go away and find homes of their own. Ever said that? Where does that come from? Well, according to the Bible, it comes from this heart of ours. It's deceitful. But you know, the thing that it deceives is not other people necessarily. The thing about our hearts is it deceives us. We can actually deceive ourselves to be thinking that we are all right, that we're really good people, we're really nice people, we're really sinless people, or at least we don't really do very bad sins. We're really fairly good. We're not the worst of sinners. But that's a deception, because you know what the Bible says? We've all sinned, and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And if we think differently, we're being deceived. And it's our hearts that are deceiving us. And so we've got to be very careful about how we think of our hearts. That's what the Bible says. Our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. Now, there's another word that will possibly get right up your nose this morning as you're listening to me speaking. How dare you suggest that I'm wicked? I'm not wicked. 
I might now and again be naughty, but I'm certainly not wicked. And you know, that's because we sometimes don't understand what the Bible means about being wicked. For example, in the Bible, just prior to the flood, and God flooded the earth and saved Noah and his family, the reason God gives for flooding the earth was because of the wickedness of the people. Now, you might imagine, boy, they must have really been dreadful. The things that they were doing must really have been abominable. Dreadful, dreadful things. But when you read in the New Testament about the people at that time, it says this, they were giving, they were marrying and giving in marriage. They were thoroughly enjoying themselves. They were heedless and careless about God, and they were getting on with their lives and doing what they wanted to do. They were living, the Bible tells us, and we only discover this from our Bible, that the wickedness was inappropriate behavior. This giving in marriage and marrying, it really, it really was talking about not only what we would call normal marriage, where a man marries a woman, but it really is talking about the, 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 the marriage where men are marrying men and women are marrying women. And listen, I'm going to be very careful about saying this, but I need to say it. Where also men and women were having sexual intercourse with animals. Wow, we wouldn't do that today, would we? Well, I we would. Just a couple of weeks ago in the newspaper I was reading, there were men given jail sentences for abusing a horse sexually. Now listen, I can't for the life of me even begin to think about what on earth they were doing and what the attraction was. But they got to jail for it. And where was this happening? Well, it was happening, I stay in Greenock, and it was happening about 25 miles away from where I stay in a very kind of posh area, uh, not far from where I stay. So the hearts of men, the Bible says, are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Our hearts, if you like, are the control centre of our lives. It's where all the motivation comes from. It's where all the desires are, are, are seated. That's where our heart, what our hearts are. It's not just a storehouse of emotion or sympathy or nice things. It's not just the storehouse of love. It's actually a storehouse of evil. The Bible says itself, out of the heart comes jealousies and murder and adultery and envy and pride. Out of that heart of ours, all of these things come and are encouraged to come. Our hearts are not healthy places. And the Bible warns us about them. The Bible tells us that we need new hearts. And the Bible promises that the Lord will give us a new heart. The Bible also tells us that we need clean hearts. In Psalm 119, we read this, How shall a young man cleanse his heart or cleanse his ways? And the Bible gives the, the answer to that question by paying attention to, to heeding, to reading, and obeying the Word of God. So these hearts of ours are far from nice places, pleasant places. If you're like me, and I know you are, you wouldn't like for a minute your thoughts to be flashed on a screen for the world to see. You wouldn't like the world to hear some of the things that you mutter under your breath at times. You wouldn't want that. These things all come from our hearts. And our hearts, as the Bible says, are places of deceitfulness and wickedness. In fact, the meaning of the word wickedness or deceitful and wickedness in the Bible, the literal translation is that they are beyond curing. They are sick. Wow, a sick heart, a wicked heart. Now, I'm sure you're not particularly enjoying this this morning, but the Lord Jesus, 
himself talked about these things, and he spoke in the, in, the, in his teachings to to um, God's people, and he warned them about the, their hearts, and he was speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees, and he was speaking to them about their hearts, and he was saying that what they do is they they are particular about cleaning their cups and saucers. They're very, very fastidious about hygiene. And he said to them, it's not your hygiene that's the problem. It's your heart that's the problem. And he described their hearts this way. He says, your hearts, my heart, our hearts, he says, they're like sepulchres. We dress them up. We make them look nice so that when we visit the cemetery, they're they're lovely, they're nice, they're, they're something to be admired. But this is what Jesus said. He said, but inside these sepulchres is stinking flesh. Might look good on the outside, but in the inside is dreadful. Now, I did mention to you that in Psalm 119, there is some verses in, God, in God's Word that helps us about how we might deal with our hearts. And here's what the Bible says in Psalm 119. How can a young person stay pure? Now, I'm not a young person. You might not be a young person, but if you are a young person, here's some advice to you. By obeying your word, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now there's a, there's a method, a way of cleaning our hearts. Just the other night I was listening um, to three men, three godly men, well-known preachers um, of the word, and they were having a discussion. There was Alistair Begg, and there was Sinclair Ferguson, and there was R.C. Sproul, and they were having a conversation together. And they were asked this question by a man or a person in the audience. How do you men stay holy? How is it you men manage to live godly lives? And each of these men kind of laughed at the, uh, at the sort of innocence of the question. And each of them said, my heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That's what they said about their hearts. And these were godly, godly men, world famous Bible preachers. But that's what they said. And then the question was, is there anything you can do about it? What is it you do about it? How do you, how do you manage? How do you manage to, to discipline your life? And each of them said, I do it by what I read and what I don't read. I do it by the things that I don't look at and by the things that I do look at. The Bible speaks about that we should focus on the things that are good and pure and lovely. And that's what they do. They focus on these things. In fact, three of them said that they would a day would never pass that they would read their Bibles. And Alistair Begg said this, he said, I remember hymns from my youth, simple hymns. And he said, I love my hymn book, especially the hymns that are worthy hymns, good, solid theologi theological te teaching. He says, I love them. And singing them cleanses my heart. And you know, I think you're right. I think good reading, reading our Bibles, and studying our Bibles and allowing the Word of God to enter into our hearts deals with the heart problem. It doesn't cure it because it's incurable, but it deals with it. And listening and singing good music. Remember, Asaph was a musician and he wrote good stuff, possibly with nice tunes that they could sing. And so my message to you this morning, as it is to me this morning, is these hearts of ours, we really do need God to deal with them. 
And the Bible tells us this, that when we give our lives to the Lord Jesus, when we give our lives to God, when we, when we accept him as our Savior into our lives, that God's Holy Spirit comes into our lives. And he can give us the power and the ability to deal with the problems of our heart. He can cleanse our hearts. He, by God's word, cleanses our hearts. And so this morning, I just want to encourage each one of us. Let's get into a routine and a habit of spending time, not five minutes, not reading, if you like, word for the day and then closing over. Let's read the Bible. Let's allow the, the Word of God to come into our minds and into our hearts that we might be cleansed from our sin. Cleanse me from my sin, Lord. Put thy Word within, Lord. Make me pure and holy, Lord. Now, I hope that's your prayer today as it is mine, that we might live pure and holy lives. That's my prayer. May God bless each one of you this morning.